Muito obrigado, Vice-Presidente Dombrov. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Vice President, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Let us now continue with the debate with the, the various speakers who are on the list. And the first will be Marcus Ferber, one and a half minutes. Uh, Parliament, uh, Vice President. Uh, Executive Vice President, uh, President of the uh, ECB. Dear colleagues, uh, we have seen that the European Central Bank uh, has taken a look at monetary policy strategy, and uh, it's obviously setting a very clear path, and I'm very glad that you have addressed these issues. There's one thing that, however, is not at the uh, disposition of the assessment, and that is uh, uh, guaranteeing, maintaining um, price stability. This is something that sometimes is not always uh, focused on, but if you take a look at the treaties, the main task of the ECB uh, is to guarantee price stability. That is the main objective. Monetary policy, therefore, has to be implemented in order to achieve this goal. I'm wondering, however, whether the goal and the objective that you've set yourself as a I, an inflation rate of almost but just under 2%, whether this is the right goal and objective. For very many years now, you have actually missed the goal, missed the target. And as you yourself have said, in the Eurozone, we can see that inflation rate is considerably lower than this figure. And I think we would have to ask ourselves whether this inflation rate objective should be used uh, as a yardstick for other aspects of the policy. We've seen a demographic change, uh, the transition to a services economy, and uh, we've seen uh, savings going up all around the world. And this means, of course, that the inflation rate is going to stay low for quite a long time. And this is something you're not going to be able to stem and halt with uh, the purchase uh, programs. So I would very much urge you to review this 2% inflation rate. On the digital euro, I'm very happy that the ECB is now picking up on this system. I must say, I have, um, I'd rather have it uh, from the ECB rather than Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, thank you very much. I'd now like to hand the floor to Pedro Marques. Two minutes. Muito obrigado, Sr. Presidente, Madam President Lagarde, Vice President Dombrovskis. Mario Draghi will always be known for saving the euro. You and your team, Madam Lagarde, can also be part of history if you continue to do what it takes to save the European economy through this crisis. The time we live asks for decisive action. The European citizens deserve a response that lives up to their expectations, a swift, fair and sustainable recovery. The truth is that ECB has been playing a crucial role in it. While the decisions for a coordinated, mutualized fiscal response takes their time to deliver. So let me congratulate you, you and your team, Madam Lagarde, for having reacted to the pandemic without delay, in particular through the PEP, but also with the targeted lending, uh, the collateral easing, among other measures. They were essential to keep the European economy afloat, and this report recognizes that much. But now it's necessary to finance the recovery. We all agree that a good part of this push can come from fiscal policy. We wish the results from the European bazooka to come soon, but monetary policy can and should still go a long way, also contributing to the structural objectives of the Union, like well-being, employment, and yes, tackling climate change, as you well pointed out, Madame Lagarde. For starters, the support from the ECB to the economy cannot be withdrawn in the near future. On the contrary, it must be reinforced to stimulate the recovery now and in the long run, because the faster and more durable the recovery, the less economic and social consequences for Europe, for the European project and for our citizens. You promised to use all the tools to produce the most effective, efficient and proportionate outcome to support the recovery. It is a statement that meets the ambition of Draghi's whatever it takes. 
and this parliament notes and compliments you for that. Now it's time to deliver on that promise. Whatever non-traditional measures it might take, I would add, it's time for action. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. Muito obrigado. Yeah, thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand the floor to Engina Eroglu for one and a half minutes. Sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, sehr President, Ms. Lagarde, Mr. Brofsky, and everybody watching this on screens at home, the report for the ECB is always very sensitive, and it's something that you need to look at closely. The independence of the European Central Bank is the pillar for our common um, um, currency in the EU. Because at the end of the day, our currency is in international competition with other currencies. As a controlling body, we in the European Parliament have the job of monitoring the situation. We need to look at what needs to be done on both sides. First of all, we need to look closely at what's happening in the day to day, and we need to look to the future. The climate change is something that the ECB has in its mandate, but we have to make sure that it doesn't become a second European investment bank. I'm very happy that even the minor in inverted commas subjects of this uh, report are not left aside, such as savings and uh, generations. It's also very important, and I hope that this is going to be the case, that we don't weaken the report through amendments. I'd like to take up a couple of points which are very important to me and which are beginning to come to the fore in the EP, and that is that member states should be let off debts through the European Central Bank. Can I ask you to be independent and ensure that any loans taken out to the ECB are paid back, just as all citizens have to pay back their loans. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Yes, thank you very much. And Francesca Donata now for one minute. Grazie, Presidente. Presi thank you, President. President Lagarde. The ECB mandate, alongside its main objective of price stability, also involves supporting the general economic policies of the Union, contributing to achieving its objectives. That includes sustainable growth, territorial cohesion and full employment. In order to support the economic recovery in the Eurozone, you wisely have appealed to full alignment of fiscal and monetary policy. Today, would it not be right to have health policies in the member states uh, flanked as well to ensure an effective recovery? There's a new approach which is required uh, with domestic care based on new update, up-to-date um, protocols to take the load off hospitals and allow the reopening of all productive activity. That is a vital prerequisite in order to enjoy economic recovery. I trust uh, in the support of those countries with the courage and capacity to open up uh, businesses and uh, citizens uh, that are restricting consumption as soon as possible. Europeans cannot live in this ongoing state of irrational health terrorism. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Yes, thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand the floor to Philip Lombez for one and a half minutes. Madam President, we unreservedly support the European Central Bank in its desire and will to guarantee at all costs the viability of the euro. However, I would like to address two blind spots of the monetary policy which your predecessor, Mario Draghi, very often kicked into touch. First of all, there are, of course, the environmental challenges, in particular climate challenges, and what we've heard from you does 
you know, represent a new kind of discourse, and we would very much encourage you to move from intentions to specific actions, given the urgency and environmental urgency. Firstly, uh, how, uh, then I'd like to address the inequalities. By spending thousands of billions of euro in the financial sector, the European Central Bank has contributed to artificially inflating share prices and housing prices. And the beneficiaries, the owners of capital, a minority that tends to be male, white, underaged, an older uh, group of the population, and a minority which has become outrageously rich over the last 20 years, that thanks to globalization, technological e evolution, and also tax evasion, tax avoidance, uh, as uh, uh, we've seen recently with the relations uh, this morning of what's going on in Luxembourg. Young people, low-wage owners, uh, the ones that are sub suffering from austerity, austerity, and they have no clear prospects. And if they want to take out loans, they're going to have to uh, do this uh, doubly so, become indebted for a long time. And Madame Lagarde, there's not only one single way of carrying out a, an expansive uh, monetary policy in the ECB must try and avoid anything which would aggravate the social divide and try and reduce this uh, by limiting the financial capacity, uh, those who have the financial capacity to get even more indecent profits, Madam President, environmental impact uh, and on our planet and precarity and exclusion uh, that are being inflicted on an ever greater number of uh, human beings are, are two time bombs which, if they explode, could be fatal to our societies. If it's high time for MEPs to assume their responsibilities, the ECB cannot shirk its. So it's time we count on you. Six Thank you. I'd now like to hand the floor uh, to Mr. Van Overwell. Madame Lagarde, Mr. Dombrovskis, uh, thank you both for being here, colleagues. In the context of the report we're discussing today, I would like to make four remarks and, of course, uh, ask them some related questions. First of all, uh, I think it's more to, uh, than fair to say that, of course, given the circumstances that have fallen upon us, we're still in a very unusual situation with respect to the stance of monetary policy with a huge balance sheet increasing by the day further and negative nominal policy rates. A return to a more normal policy stance is, of course, not for tomorrow, not for next week, probably also not for next month, but I think it would be good to, more, uh, to be more explicit about the guidepost that the path to normality uh, will uh, be. Secondly, we see today unmistakable signs of uh, bubbles, uh, major bubbles in equity markets and other financial markets, more or less linked all to the, what I would call overabundance of liquidity. These bubbles are a constant threat to financial stability, and by now we all know that financial stability is, of course, closely linked to price stability, the major objective of monetary policy in the euro area. I think it's time to rethink the stance of monetary policy by taking these elements, uh, bubbles, financial stability, dangers more explicitly into consideration. Thirdly, Thomas Piketty and 150 other economists have called for, very recently, the cancellation of government debt uh, by the ECB. I would be inclined to ask whether you share that opinion, but that's, of course, I think a superfluous uh, question. But do you think the ECB statutes allow for such an action? Fourthly, when a government crisis looms in a highly indebted country within the euro area, it always tends to make financial markets overnight more nervous, which overnight also tends to lead to increasing spreads. My question is, does the ECB consequently stand ready to intervene in such circumstances in order to keep these spreads down? Thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Yes, thank you very much. Now, I'd like to hand the floor to uh, Mr. Papadimoulis for one minute. Kyrie Lagarde, Kyrie Dombrovskis. Madam Lagarde, Mr. Dombrovskis, it's very positive that the recovery fund was created and that a purchase program has been put in place for the pandemic. But the activity and the duration of the crisis and the extent of the crisis show that debt 
is amounting to over 100% of GDP in the Eurozone, and I think that really comes out in the figures. These steps aren't uh, possible. Uh, They can't uh, deal with that. I think, Madam President, it's a case of whatever it takes in conjunction with the European Commission so that the Eurozone doesn't become a debt zone and so that the European economy does not face an an existential crisis and have to go through that. You said, uh, President Lagarde, in March, it's out of the box and not business as usual. We need a European solution for the debt situation. Corona debts must be reset, those that have been caused by the pandemic. A hundred economists have proposed that and they've undershored why that kind of solution is necessary. And in terms of stability characteristics, we must ensure that something is devised that is consistent with sustainable development. And the fund that will be adopted tomorrow needs to see its funding double to 1.3 billion. Thank you very much. Obviously, there was a problem with the image. Sorry for that. A technical issue, but the interpreters were uh, informed and uh, we got the uh, translation. Um, so now I uh, move forward and I will give the floor to uh, Darian uh, Rookmaker for, uh, one by, for one minute. Yeah. Achter aanwezige. The COVID. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID crisis has shown one thing very clearly. We can't get on without good risk management. Risk management enables us to anticipate what happens in the future. Integrated risk management helps us to be prepared. In 1995, we were warned that there was significantly increased risk of a pandemic because of exploitation of nature and globalization. In 2003, the Institute of Medicine came with a supplementary report and said it was no matter of whether there would be a pandemic, but that when. In 2017, we got another warning as well, but in 2019, in the Europe, European Central Bank's report, there's nothing about the threat of a pandemic. It was even considered less probable than in 2018. As the most important financial institution in Europe, the ECB should be able to model the health situation. Looking at the situation we're at the moment, I can't help wondering how good the risk management is in the the European Central Bank. Is it time? 